And thank you to everyone who came out tonight and who's watching online. I really appreciate it. I know not everyone knows me, so I want to give a really quick introduction on myself. My name is Bradley Smith. Everyone calls me Brad, and that's completely fine. Um, husband to an amazing and beautiful wife, father to two boys, and I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here with you guys tonight. I grew up in a family that was divided religiously, but um, we, it was a great family nonetheless. We all got along, and I say that because I truly believe that this message is for a believer, is someone who is a believer, and also some, for someone who is not yet a believer. I think it can benefit you wherever you are in life, and that's my hope and my prayer. Um, so that's just a real quick intro on myself. Um, we can go ahead and jump right into it. You can see the title of it tonight is Jesus and the Reclaiming of the Nations. So really, what does that mean? What are the nations? Why do they need reclaiming? And how does Jesus play a part in that? And that's kind of the blueprint for where we're going to be going tonight. We're going to first, we're going to establish what the nations are, then why they need reclaiming, and again, how Jesus is going to be a part of that. It's not a salvation-based message. So if it's not, that kind of begs the question, what's the point of it? And the point really is just to clear the fog on some of these odd passages, these quote-unquote weird passages we see in the Bible, right? The Bible has a lot of weird stories in it, and it's okay to say that because we're separated from the worldview of the biblical writers and the biblical authors. Um, the, the Bible was not written to us. I know I said that on Sunday when Jeremy had me come up here, but the Bible was written for us. And so to understand it best, we need to get back into that worldview of the Bible. And when we do that, the fog's going to clear. These passages, these verses, and stories are going to make a lot more sense. I also hope that this deepens our understanding of the overall biblical narrative, and that's restoring the world to that Edenic state that we find in Genesis. And what I mean by Edenic state, this is a little picture of it, is we have the supernatural realm up here, we've got the earthly realm here, and where the two overlap right there, you can see the green mountaintop and garden, that is Eden. That's paradise, that's where Adam and Eve walked with God. And ever since the fall in the garden, God has been longing to bring humanity back to that state of paradise. We read in Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth, that's the Eden, that's Eden as he desires it. So we're working to get there. And I love how Dr. Tim Mackey puts it. He is head of the Bible Project, if you've seen those videos before. He said this on a podcast recently. I thought it was so beautiful and yet so simple. He said, the Bible is a book that you have to study. It's designed to be studied, not simply read. And I think, again, no matter where we are in life, if, you're, if we're believers and our faith is the cornerstone of our life, we owe it to not just ourselves, not just the biblical writers who were inspired, no doubt, but we owe it to God to study it out. Not just read over something that sounds odd, weird, and strange and kind of check it off a list of, oh, I read that, but I don't ever have to come back to it again. I can at least say I read it. And again, if, if you're listening and you're not a believer, we owe it to the Bible as well, or you would owe it to the Bible as well, to really dive into that worldview. So that if, if you have questions about the Bible, you can better understand it. Or if you're in the boat of being somewhat hostile to the Bible, you want to be fair to the Bible. If you're going to criticize it, we first need to understand it, right? So again, that's just to categorize that I think this is for everyone tonight. So with that being said, let's jump into studying it. We're going to go into one of these weird passages that involves, who else, our favorite character, Jesus. It's found in the 10th chapter of Luke, and it's when Jesus sends out 70 disciples. We read in verse 1 that after this, the Lord, being Jesus, appointed 70 others, and he sent them on ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go in pairs of two. Verses 8 and 9 really give us the instructions that Jesus gave these 70, and it says, Wherever you, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near. Now, this is a classic Jesus cliffhanger moment. Why does he say the kingdom of God has come near? Why, does he, why, does he tell them, why doesn't he tell them to say the kingdom of God has come? Well, it's not going to be a cliffhanger after tonight. We're going to get to the part of the kingdom actually coming. But what I really want to focus on is that theme of 70 that you've seen. One. Why 70? It seems very random. Now, is Jesus just in a room of 70 people and he decides, hey, the more the merrier. Why you guys go on ahead. Or are there 35 towns that he wants to go to? So he says, well, 35 times 2 is 70, so let's, let's just go for it. I'll send 70 out, and that's how we'll do it, so everyone has a friend. I want to make the suggestion that this is 
very theological, very strategic, and it's very intentional on Jesus' part. There is a lot of meaning to why he chooses to do this. And one thing before we kind of go a little bit further into this discussion on the nations, if you're following along, some of your versions are going to say 72, or it says 70. I just want to want to clear this really quick. Is it 70 or 72, and why is there a difference? I can answer one of those. It's a textual variance. It's not an error. It's not a contradiction. The Masoretic text, which is the traditional Hebrew Bible, has the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. That number of nations is 70. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's 72. It just has to do with how a translator or scribe divided names, but it's referring to the exact same thing, that table of nations from Genesis 10. So again, it's not an error, it's not a contradiction. And moving forward, I'm going to be using 70, not necessarily because I think it's better, but just so you know, if you're following along and you have 72, when, when you see 72 and I say 70, we're talking about the same thing. So we've talked a little bit about why, why 70 is important, and that's because, again, it, it refers to the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. That's theologically significant because that is the entire known world at the time of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, 70 nations. And as we continue to, to study this out, this is just a short little laundry list of where we'll be going tonight and kind of how we'll be studying out this 70. So just a quick little sneak peek of it. But this right here is a map of the Table of Nations in Genesis chapter 10. And I don't want you just to see a bunch of names on a map scattered all around. What this is really a representation of is the entire world, 70 nations that are hostile to Yahweh, they are in rebellion against Yahweh, and ultimately they have been disinherited by Yahweh because of that rebellion. So you're going to see this map plenty more tonight, I promise. So fold it up, put it away, come back to it later. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy, for laughing at that. But, um, so, but I want to explore how we got those nations, how we got to those 70 nations, and why they were in hostility, rebellion, and ultimately disinherited. Because Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1, it tells us that the whole earth had one language and were one people. It was a united earth. But if we were to keep reading in Genesis 11, we would come to the famous Tower of Babel, just a couple verses later. And that Tower of Babel gives us the biblical historical account of what humanity did and why ultimately God dispersed them at Babel. But before we get to the biblical historical account, I want us to look at it from a spiritual perspective. What happened supernaturally? What happened spiritually at Babel that God did? And to, and to explore that, we need to look at Deuteronomy 32. This is much later, obviously, in the Bible, Deuteronomy being the fifth book, but this is a summary of Babel. And in verse 8 it says, When the Most High, that's God, gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the sons of God. But Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob has allotted inheritance. Now one important notion to make, because this is a summary, and they're recapping the Babel event, there's about three to four, maybe more generations between verses 8 and 9. Jacob is another name for Israel. Remember, we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob gets renamed Israel. Israel is not on that 70 nations map. Israel had not been created yet. God had not brought them out and created them as a nation. But Israel would ultimately become Yahweh's portion and his allotted heritage. So that's, and that's just an important feature to keep in mind as we move forward, because what God did, we read up in verse 8 again, is the nations got an inheritance. And the, the inheritance of the nations was that Yahweh divided mankind, he fixed their, the borders of the people, and then he did so again according to the numbers of God. Those are three very important points. And I do want to point out that, again, this is my last little translation thing for the night, I promise, but some translations are going to have sons of, sons of Israel and not sons of God. I want to say this is not me saying this. This is the academic world of biblical studies, and this is also the Dead Sea Scrolls confirming that the correct translation is sons of God. And we really, we don't even need the academic world or the Dead Sea Scrolls for that because, again, we remember in verse 9, Israel hadn't been created yet. So God couldn't have divided the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of a nation that did not yet exist. So this, but this is what I want you to see. This is Babel. This is where God divides the nation. He allots them away, and he does so, again, to those sons of God. So um, 
moving forward, we see all throughout Deuteronomy, there's allotment language. At, we just saw in Deuteronomy 32 that God's allotted, Yahweh's allotted, is Israel. But the nations have an allotment too. And this in Deuteronomy 4 is Moses giving a warning to the people not to worship the gods of the nations. And he's, he tells them, he says, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be, draw, you be drawn away and bow down and worship them. These are things that Yahweh your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. So the nations have an allotment, the host of heaven, right? This is why we see pantheons of sun god worship, moon god worship, star worship all throughout the Bible because Yahweh disinherited and allotted those nations that were in rebellion away. And I promise we'll get to the why of that here in just a bit. Here's one more example. This is one of those hypothetical situations where Yahweh gives a warning through Moses, and he, he says, if you are to turn away from the covenant that you have made with Yahweh, this is what's going to happen. And it's a hypothetical question being asked, and I'm sorry, I've got to turn around because I can't quite see it with the background I've put up there. But the response is, what is and essentially what, what happens is they are saying that the curses are going to be carried out on the land if they break covenant, and people are going to ask, why did God curse this land? And the answer is, it is because they abandoned the covenant of, covenant of Yahweh, the God of their fathers. They went and served other gods. They worshiped them, the gods whom they had not known, whom he had not allotted to him. So it's just more example of this allotment language throughout Deuteronomy. The nations have been allotted away. And again, I know it seems very strange that God would do this, that he would just give people away. He would disinherit them because he's supposed to be a loving God, right? That's what we hear. So I want to explore ultimately how it got to that, why they were disinherited. We've kind of seen what the consequences of their actions at Babel were, but I want to see, but I want us to explore really the why behind it. And a real quick summary, we have the fall in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve are in paradise. They're in the Garden of Eden. They sin, and they're driven out of Eden, right, the fall. Then three, ver or three chapters later, we have another fall. And this time, instead of a fall of humanity, it's a divine fall. It's a, really a divine rebellion. It's when the sons of God come to the daughters of men. They reproduce. This is the Nephilim story, for you guys familiar with that. And verse 5 tells us that the thoughts of man was continuous evil. The result of this is the rest of Genesis chapter 6 through 8. God brings a flood, but he does something incredible. He saves one family. He saves Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. And then in chapter 9... He restores the Edenic covenant that he had with Adam and Eve, the be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So he's trying to restart right here. We had Eden, Eden failed, so he tries it again, and then one chapter later in Genesis 10, we get back to this map, the nations, that again are that representation of the disinheritance. So in one chapter, humanity has fallen again. And how did that happen? We looked at the spiritual consequences of it. Here's the biblical historical account of it. It's Later on, three verses later on in Genesis chapter 11, remember we had the whole earth that was one, they were united people, had one language? Well, instead of walking out this Edenic covenant, they get together and they say, come, let's build ourselves a city and we'll build a tower and we're going to make a great name for ourselves. Now, this picture that you see right here of this temple, this is the tower that's being referred to. This is kind of unanimous amongst um, biblical studies that it was this particular temple being referenced here, this particular tower, is known as a ziggurat. And a ziggurat was what you built if you wanted to tame a deity and you wanted to bring the deity down to you. So in other words, what they're doing is they're getting together and they're saying, hey, instead of multiplying and fill the earth, we're going to tame Yahweh and we're going to bring him down to us and it's going to make our name great. And how, how, and how it's going to do that how it's going to give them a great name is that if you want to go worship Yahweh, you now have to go to their city, and it will make them a great name because they're the home of God. You can imagine God didn't like this too much. <laughs> Three verses later, we find the judgment on it, and this is really, this is a divine court scene because we can see it's a collective decision being made. You know, what are the consequences going to be? And the decision that's made is, come, let us go down and confuse their language. And then verse 8 is, so Yahweh dispersed them 
from there all over the face of the earth. Now, I have bolded in verse 7 this us, and what I was taught growing up, and I think kind of the, kind of the majority of the teaching is, is that this is the Trinity. This is a reference of the Trinity in the Old Testament. I want to make the suggestion that this is not the Trinity. I want to suggest that this is the sons of God that were referenced in Deuteronomy 32. This is the sons of God and Yahweh together making a decision on what they're going to do because of the people at Babel's rebellion. And then you'll notice in verse 8, Yahweh acts alone. So it's a collective decision on what to do, and then Yahweh carries out the judgment. The analogy I could give is that if all of us here decided to get pizza afterwards, but Jeremy was the one to go pick up the pizza, we decided together to, coll to collectively to have that, but Jeremy's the one who actually performed the action. So I know this seems kind of fairy tale-ish. A fairy tale worldview, maybe it's poetic. I know the thought might be going through your mind. Is this just a creative, poetic way to kind of explain things, how people got dispersed all over the earth? And again, I want to make the suggestion that no, this is a theme all throughout the Bible. This 70 nations and disinheritance is in the time of Jesus and the time after Jesus in the New Testament. And I think we see this best when Paul is invited to Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. He's invited before a group known as the Areopagus. And the Areopagus is basically a supreme court of Greek philosophers and their main interest was defending the Greek concept of the gods. And they liked hearing new things. So when Paul comes to town and he's preaching the gospel of Jesus, they hadn't heard it before. And so they invited him to come speak. They just, you know, it's kind of a, hey, you're, you're telling us something new. We'll listen. Come on. And in the middle of Paul's gospel message to them, this is the message that Paul gives. He said, and he, he's referencing God, made from one man every nation of mankind, to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. This is Deuteronomy 32, that allotment language, that division at Babel, dividing 70 nations. This is in the middle of Paul's gospel message. And what's very interesting to note about this is that Paul is speaking language that they would understand. Because if you go back, you can still go back and read Greco-Roman texts from men, writers such as Homer and Plato. And those texts talk about how the Greco-Roman world worships the gods they do because those gods were allotted to them to worship. So that's right within their text. And what Paul's saying is, hey, I know the one true God. I know the creator of the universe, the God that allotted those other gods to you. And guess what? He came to earth as a man named Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified and he rose again. And now he's calling you home. You no longer have to serve these other gods you've been serving. It's time to come back to Yahweh. And it's time to put your faith in Jesus. And what Paul does in the next verse is he answers a very important question as to why God ultimately allotted the nations away. It was out of love. It was so that they should seek God and perhaps find their way back to him. If you've heard testimonies of people that have grown up in good homes and they've become rebellious and ultimately they get kicked out of the house, one thing that you'll often hear if they return, make a good name for themselves, etc., is I never knew how good I had it until I was kicked out. It's a turning point for them. And that's exactly what God was doing when he disinherited them in hopes that they would come back. And ultimately, just like humanity failed, and we saw the divine realm fail, the supernatural realm in Genesis 6, God allotted those sons of God that we talked about. They were actually given the allotment. And it was part of their mission to help point the people back to Yahweh. And just like humanity failed and the supernatural failed, they failed again in this task. And we see the judgment in Psalm 82. This is, this is God now judging those sons of God that he was originally judging people with, judging humanity with. Verse 1, it says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And that's, again, the, that reference to the gods is those sons of God, those divine beings. And this, this is not a good judgment for them. In verse 2, it reads, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And as he continues, it doesn't get any better. So, in other words, what God is telling them is that you failed in your task to point these people of these nations back to me. 
And ultimately, the judgment that God gives is he says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. And one quick thing I want to point out, I just think this is fascinating, but I, don't want to, I can't spend a lot of time on it, is this word arise right here. And we talked about the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and that was the common Bible in the time of Jesus and the disciples. That's what they were, if you read New Testament authors quoting the Old Testament, it's most often in line with what the Septuagint says, because it was, you know, they were ruled by Rome, so they had, that was their language. That was the Bible that they used. But this word arise, if you were reading this, it's, it's Strong's G450. You can go back and check it and read on it. I would encourage you to do it. That word arise is the same word that is associated with rising up in the resurrection. So if someone who knows the story of Jesus, who's seen all that Jesus has done, they come back and read this verse, arise, resurrection, O God, Jesus resurrecting, judging the earth, and then inheriting the nations. That's the gospel message right there in the Old Testament. It's absolutely fascinating. Again, that's all the time we're going to spend on that point, but I would encourage you guys to go study it a little bit deeper. It's, it's truly, it, it's just fascinating. So what's God's plan from here? Humanity's failed, the divine realm has failed. Well, guess what? God has, God has a great plan in place. And that plan is in Genesis 12 and involves a man named Abram who he calls out of the nations who would become known as Abraham. And he tells Abraham to leave his country, the country of his fathers, and he tells Abraham, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless your name. I will make your name great. So how they tried to make their name great at Babel, God actually says, hey, I'm going to make my own nation and their name is going to be great. And then all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through them. And Abraham and Sarah are the perfect couple to do this. Why? Because they can't have kids. And they've tried and tried and tried and they can't do it. So it's going to take a miracle for them to have children and ultimately become a nation. And now when, when we see the fulfillment of that happening, all the nations are going to know that it was through a miraculous act that God's people came to be. There's going to be no question in their minds. So we, we really have covered up until, again, I, may, I don't want to fast forward to that slide yet, sorry. Um, but um, up until this point, we've gone basically Genesis 1 through 12. You'll see a shift. After Genesis 12, it becomes ultimately Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like we said before, they become Israel. But after Genesis 12, the narrative of the Bible shifts. And it's now God and his people, who would become Israel, against the nations and their gods. And that's where the shift takes place. So now that we've kind of seen what the nations are, how they came to be, I want to dive into God's reallotment plan, how he's going to take back those nations, what's his plan to do it. We find this in Daniel chapter 7. There's a very curious figure that comes into the picture. It's the Son of Man. And he comes to the Ancient of Days. And who is Yahweh? He's presented before him. And it says, And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And right here, what's very important to notice, the Son of Man figure in this, you can see it pretty well in the picture, when he's given that authority, he is made equal with Yahweh, with the Ancient of Days. And this, you're probably, you've probably already guessed it, who that's a reference to, or who we see it as in the New Testament, Jesus, the Son of Man. We see Jesus on trial before his crucifixion. He's brought to the Sanhedrin, the highest supreme court in all of Judaism. And the high priest questions Jesus. And he says, I adjure you, by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Before, I, before we get into Jesus' response of what that is, I want to point out something that I think is just a beautiful picture of the natural world reflecting the spiritual world. The Sanhedrin was supposed to serve and do justice to the people, right? If I were to ask you how many members of the Sanhedrin do you think there are, what would your answer be? Is anyone brave enough? Seventy? All right, I'm sorry. This is my one opportunity for a trick question tonight. It's actually not 70. It's 71. There are 70 members plus a high priest. We have 70 nations at Babel. God creates a new nation out of Abraham and Sarah, which makes 71 nations. And where does our king and high priest that Jeremy talked about on Sunday come from? 
that 71st nation. It's just a beautiful picture of, again, the natural reflecting the spiritual. So I, I just thought that was cool. I wanted to share that with you guys. It was just very exciting when I came across that. But we'll get back into Jesus' answer. Jesus answers the high priest, and he, t- and he says, you have said so. So you have said that I'm the Son of God. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And we're often kind of taught, I, I feel like at least I was again, that this is kind of a cute response from Jesus. He's kind of saying, oh, you know, beating around the bush a little bit. Like, I'm not going to tell you I'm directly the Son of God, but you kind of said it was so. I'm just the Son of Man, no big deal. Uh, but I, again, I want to make the suggestion that Jesus was doing anything but being cute in this response. He tells him, he says, yeah, I'm the son of God, but guess what? I'm also that son of man figure from Daniel chapter 7, who is going again to get dominion, and all the peoples and all the nations and languages are going to serve me. This is enough for the high priest. We talked about a little bit earlier how the son of man was made equal with Yahweh. This is where the high priest, again, from that that picture, he tears his robe and he, (laughs) He says, what more do we need? This is blasphemy. He's made himself one with God. And then that's when they decide to kill him. So again, we see, (coughs) excuse me, um, we see once Jesus ultimately, he's crucified after that judgment from the Sanhedrin, he's buried and he's resurrected. And 40 days after his resurrection and right before his ascension, is a passage known as the Great Commission. And Jesus tells his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now up until his crucifixion, Jesus' ministry had just been in the land of Israel. He never went outside of Israel. In fact, Matthew 15, 24 actually alludes to this when he's questioned And he says, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But here we have Jesus saying, now go out into the nations. So what happened? We remember at the garden tomb when Mary comes to him and he says, Mary, don't touch me yet. I have not yet ascended to the Father. He ascended to the Father and then the authority was given to him when he came back. And now he's telling his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations. This is the beginning of the movement of Christianity, of the church spreading into the nations, right? But the disciples aren't going anywhere. The disciples, 10 days from then, is Pentecost. A feast I know Jeremy's taught a little bit on, but Pentecost, what makes it unique is that Pentecost is a pilgrimage festival, which means that all males, all Jewish males, had to present themselves in Jerusalem for for this festival, And Jesus' disciples, being all Jewish, were no doubt going. They went 10 days later, so they couldn't go into the nations yet. But we read something interesting at Pentecost, and it says, There were at that time dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation. And you remember the story at Pentecost when the wind comes rushing in and the Holy Spirit fills the place, and everybody starts talking in different languages. Well, you have those people from the nation saying, we hear them telling us the miraculous works of God in our own language, but how are they doing this? And this is where we get, you know, that that kind of famous passage of they're being accused of being drunk at 11 in the morning, and Peter gets up and he gives a huge sermon. And after Peter's sermon, something amazing happens. After his sermon, 3,000 souls are saved. They're brought in to believing in Jesus. But why this is so interesting is that Pentecost is a commemoration of Mount Sinai. Remember in the the wilderness, Mount Sinai, Moses comes down, he gives the law. Well, at Mount Sinai, there was disobedience going on. And 3,000 Israelites perished because of their disobedience. They were killed. Here at Pentecost, when the spirit of the law comes, the Holy Spirit, 3,000 souls are redeemed and saved. And then in verse 47, we learn, because they're here, they're here a while, we learn in verse 47 that more were being added to that number each and every day. And this right here, this is the reason that the disciples, that Paul, apostles, the writers of the New Testament, this is why they could go on mission trips. This is why they could write letters 
to places they had never been that had churches. Because when these people who came to believe from the nations went back to their home country, they took the gospel of Jesus with them, and they planted churches all over the nations. So this is the beginning of that spread again. And this is a map right here. You guys can see, I love maps. But this is a map of the nations represented at Pentecost. You can see the red writing right here is nations that were attested as being there. These, these purple areas kind of really right up in here is where they weren't attested to. So they're, they're, they didn't really have representation, or at least they didn't have believers going back there. So they still lack that gospel message. And if we fast forward five chapters in the book of Acts, we come to Stephen, known as the first martyr. Stephen is tried falsely before the Sanhedrin again. False witnesses are brought against him. He's sharing the message of Jesus, and they really don't like it. So they're like, all right, we're going to get this guy. We're going to get him. We're tired of this. So they, they bring Stephen forward, and instead of you know, giving a quick response, Stephen gives a sermon as a response. And in verses 1 through 50, he gives Israel's entire history. And then Stephen, who's supposed to be being judged, actually passes two judgments on the Sanhedrin. The first judgment makes them pretty mad. Like it, it describes it as they're kind of you know, gnashing their teeth at him a little bit. And then on the second judgment, they decide to kill Stephen. And they end up stoning Stephen to death right outside. We, we all know the famous stoning of Stephen with Saul present, who most likely was the Paul that we see two chapters later. But really, why was he killed? Why was he stoned? What did he say that made them so mad that they decided to literally drag him out in the street and kill him right then and there. He told them, he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What he's saying here is, I see Jesus. He's the Son of Man. And you killed the Son of Man. You killed God who came down to earth to redeem you. And now he's standing at the right hand of God with all authority and if you don't place your trust in him, you are as disinherited as the nations at Babel. That's, that's not the thing you tell the Sanhedrin, much less the high priest if you're looking to save your neck. So they ultimately kill him. And they place their, you know, the men that stone him place their robes as witness, again, in front of the feet of a man named Saul. Who later, we don't have, it's not 100%, but I think it's pretty, it's pretty safe to say that this is who we know as Paul. And again, that's just a reference back to the Daniel 7.14 that Stephen was, was referencing. But this Paul, to fast forward two chapters, he has an encounter with Jesus. And it 180s his life. A man who is persecuting the church, who is killing Christians, who is hunting them down, has an encounter with the resurrected Jesus and becomes one of his greatest apostles. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles. That was Paul's mission. That's how he described himself. And Paul takes three missionary journeys that were told about in Acts. These are just the passages if you wanted to write them down and go, go look at where he went later. But Paul sums up his ministry, his apostleship, his mission, if you will, in Romans. And he says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith, for the sake of his name among the nations. So Paul's going to the nations. He still has this worldview in mind. These 70 nations need to be redeemed. You know, Yahweh is ultimately going to inherit them, and it's my mission to go out and spread the word of Jesus. This is a map of Paul's first two missionary journeys. Kind of see the first one's a little short. The first, one, the first one's literally just right through here. And the second one he really takes up all through here. And then the third one, again, it's kind of a repeat of that uh, second one. He spends a lot of time up in this area, a lot of time. And why does he do that? Because that's the area of purple that was not attested at Pentecost. Paul knows that. He also hits up um, Galatia right here. His, his book, his letter to the Galatians, that's who it was addressed to. But Paul, Paul knows Pentecost, and he's on a mission to save those nations that ha had not yet received the gospel. So again, here's back to that Tower of Babel. This is that map of the 70 nations. And this, this orange right here is just where Paul has hit, up into this, this kind of the area we've been looking at. These areas in white were purple, and Paul ended up going to those places. But there's one area he doesn't go, Sicily, right here, this little island. And as we'll see in just a minute, Paul wasn't really planning to go there, but God allowed it to happen. God altered his plans. Paul's ultimate desire, though, is to get to Spain. 
He tells the Romans this, or the church at Rome this, in his letter to them. And he says, I hope to see you while I'm passing through to go to Spain. I'm going to Jerusalem right now, but again, I will leave and go to Spain by way of you. So he's saying, hey, and up until this point, he really hasn't seen them yet. He hasn't visited the church in Rome. At least I don't believe he has. But he's telling him, he's saying, hey, I'm going to come to you. I've got plans to come to you, but I'm really just going to be passing through because I need to get to Spain. Why is he so adamant on getting to Spain? And uh, that's just, this is just to show you where Rome, Rome is. It's pretty west on that map we've been looking at. But for anyone who knows their geography, Spain is right here. It's the last of the 70 nations. It's the furthest west in the known world. It's where Tarshish was. And Paul's on a mission to get there, to get to the ends of the earth, to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And in Paul's mind, this is fulfilling that fullness of the Gentiles. I know the fullness of the Gentiles has, has multiple layers to it. I don't mean to take anything away from that. But what Paul is thinking in terms of fullness of the Gentiles is, I've got to get the full number of Gentiles out amongst the nations. So I've got to get to every last nation to bring the full number of them in. Right? So that's his mission. That's why he wants to get to Spain. Paul's ultimately taken to Rome. He doesn't go there by choice. If you remember, Acts 21 is when Paul's arrested. There's the big riot. Paul says, hey, I want to go on trial. They end up taking him to Rome. But before he gets there, Paul spends two years on the coast in prison. And then he spends two years in Rome in prison on house arrest. Now, he's preaching the gospel that entire time while he's on house arrest because he actually paid for it with his own money. He just couldn't leave. And so that begs the question, we don't find out in Acts, does Paul actually make it to Spain? And this is just kind of a side fact. But according to 1 Clement, which is just, it's, it's extra biblical material, it's talk, it talks about Paul and it says that he had come to the extremity of the West. In that particular time period, that was known as Spain. So it is very possible and very likely that Paul, in fact, made it there eventually before his martyrdom in Rome. But at present, we'll get back to Paul actually being in Rome. This is his route to Rome right here. And you remember that one area that we hadn't covered yet. This is a great example of God doing something for good. When we see bad, Paul getting arrested, his plans being changed, God's working because they get shipwrecked right here on Malta. And when they get shipwrecked on Malta, this is the scene that we find when they're gathering firewood, Paul's out there helping them, and a viper comes up and lashes, latches itself to Paul. And the men of that island say, well, this man must be a murderer because this, he's escaped from the sea, but justice will not allow him to live. Now, we hear that and we kind of think justice. Okay, we're thinking justice courtroom scene. Justice is a reference to the Roman goddess of vengeance, who is Jupiter's daughter. So again, more of this allotment, more of these gods of these allotted territories. And ultimately what Paul does, he just shakes the viper off, nothing happens to him, and the people say, wow, he must be a god. And Paul says, no, I'm not a god, but let me share the gospel with you. And he ultimately goes, and the leader of the island, island's father, is very sick, ill with a fever. Paul goes in, lays hands on him, and in Jesus' name, heals him. So Paul gets to carry out his mission trip on a shipwreck on his way to Rome. And ultimately, Paul, they go up to Sicily, and no doubt Paul's ministering his entire time there. He ultimately winds up in Rome. Now, we've, we've kind of seen the journeys of Paul and where he's gone on the, on the mission field, but I want to get back to this worldview of Paul and how it's a part of his gospel message. Paul uses a lot of language that seems somewhat confusing in his letters, and we're even warned by Peter that, hey, Paul seems confusing. Watch out for that. You've really got to study Paul and his writings to get, to get that meaning and to make him less confusing. And Paul uses a lot of these terms like elemental forces, rulers, authorities, cosmic power, dominion, and thrones. And while those can refer to human rulers, they can also refer to supernatural or divine rulership. And we're not going to look at every single one of these, so if you want these, you can write them down, but we are going to explore a couple of them. It's terms of what's known as geographical dominion. In other words, where those gods were allotted, those sons of God, where they ultimately have dominion over. It's geographical. We read in Paul's letter to the Colossians, he says, for by all him, he's talking about Jesus here. He says, for by, all, for by, him, or by, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, 
um, and sorry, I, can't, I couldn't read it from back there, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And the point I'm just trying to make there is that Jesus is greater than all of these other divine beings that were at one point given authority because they were created through him. And then if we fast forward one chapter, it's, it's a fairly famous passage where it talks about how we were dead in the uncircumcision of our flesh and that we needed redemption and forgiveness for our trespasses. And, ultimately, and Paul tells us that God did this by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he did by nailing it to the cross. And this is where I've always stopped. You know, it's just kind of, yes, you know, Jesus did it. He nailed it to the cross. I never really read the next verse. And that verse was, he disarmed the rulers and authorities by putting them to open shame, by triumphing over them. Now, when Jesus came back, he didn't conquer Rome. He didn't conquer any earthly rulers. So Paul can only be referencing one thing here, and that's those supernatural powers. Paul is saying that Jesus openly put them to shame. He disarmed them. They were the authorities, and now they're no longer the authorities. Now it's Jesus. We also see this kind of this cosmic war picture when we get to Galatians, when Paul says, "Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those who, by nature, are not gods." What he means by that is that, hey, these sons of God were never supposed to be a God figure for you. They were supposed to point you back to God, but they were never supposed to. He's referring to their divine rebellion again. And he continues, he says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be again? He's telling them, that you no longer have to serve these gods, these sons of God that were allotted to you. You don't have to. This is in Galatia, one of those purple areas that we were talking about earlier. Paul is saying they're weak and elementary principles of the world. Jesus has triumphed over them. Stop serving them. You don't have to because that authority that Jesus had, he handed to you, and you now have authority over them. This is Jesus' turf now. It doesn't belong to them anymore, so plant the church here and spread the gospel. And this is probably my favorite reference to any of this. It's in 1 Corinthians, and it's Paul talking about secret wisdom. And he says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory." So what, this is the answer to Jesus always seeming to beat around the bush when people ask him if he's the Messiah. It's why he talked in parables. Because if Jesus had openly declared that, yes, I'm the Messiah, I'm the guy, I'm here, I'm going to do that, none of the rulers of the age would have allowed him to be crucified because he would have given away his strategy, if, you, if that's a good term for it, his strategy that he was the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. And he was going to be given that authority through his resurrection. And they never would have allowed him to die because they would never have wanted him to resurrect. So it was Jesus' master plan to do that. So this, this really answers that question. I know Jeremy, I think, is going to build on this point here in the next couple of weeks and kind of how it relates to some of the other passages, which is going to be really great. But I, I, I want to thank you guys again for coming out tonight. Um, I, I really hope this is being you know, a step towards a new beginning really opening up and rethinking those strange passages. Hopefully, you'll, when you read them next time, my hope is that you'll kind of dig a little bit deeper into them and explore them and ultimately try and get back into the worldview of the biblical writers and the people that were reading the Bible. If we can get into that 70 nations, and there's more, you know, there's a, there's a lot of complexity to that worldview. It's not simply the 70 nations, but if we can get that back in, those passages that talk about God against the other gods of the nations and, you know, the people against the nations. You know, this land doesn't belong. You know, they can't go in this land because it's allotted away and there's going to be hostility if the Israelites enter. That It's my hope that those passages will make a little bit more sense and that ultimately, just to remember that the Bible, again, I know I've said this a couple times, was not written to us, but it was written for us. It, we have a lot to learn from it. It is applicable to our lives. But again, we've got to get back to that worldview, the context of it, because that's how we will understand it best. Now, I did tell you, I wasn't going to leave you with a cliffhanger, but this is, the, this is the joyful part of the 70 returning. 
They come back to Jesus, and they are filled with joy. And they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus tells them, he says, behold, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then he goes on to tell them how he has given them authority. When he says, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven, this is the beginning of the end for Satan's kingdom. He's conquered Satan, and the head guy, the head rebel, all the way back from Genesis chapter 3, has fallen. And his kingdom is coming to an end. And we get to take part in that mission. And it's truly my hope that as you and I both walk out the Great Commission of making disciples of all nations, that we will receive that same joy that the 70 did, and ultimately that we will one day hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So again, thank you guys so much for allowing me to be here and for everyone that tuned in online. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand it over back over to Jeremy real quick. Before I do that, I do want to give more of a tribute and a thanks. Um, this is... Uh, the picture up here is a man named, his name is Dr. Michael Heiser. He's an Old Testament scholar, and what he does is he, he really makes information, scholarly information, available to just people who do not study it for a living, and he makes it readable. And he's someone that has really shifted my life, my way of thinking. He's had a profound impact on my faith. And I found out this weekend, I don't know him personally, but I found out this weekend that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and they're waiting to see if it spreads. So I, I believe, just like everyone who gets up here said, that this church is truly a house of healing, and that we've seen so much healing in it up until this point with cancers and everything else. But I want to ask that you know, we add Mike to that list and that you guys continue to pray for him. He's done so much for the kingdom, and I think it's a great time um, to back him up and also just to pray that cancer does not spread for his family. And that's, that really is just kind of my way of saying thank you to him and also to lift up a brother. He is a believer. So, but um, that's it.